Good evening, everyone, and uh, a very good morning to uh, Professor uh, Karen Thul. I'm Satish Giripudi from IIT Madras. I welcome you all to this keynote session. The importance of uh, mini channels and micro channels for cooling applications needs uh, no introduction, but uh, their applications are limited by the fabrication constraints especially for complex geometries. We now have a keynote talk on exploring additive manufacturing for cooling channel designs to be delivered by Professor Karen To, a distinguished professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering at the Pennsylvania State University. Professor Toll's main research interest is in the area of cooling of gas turbine airfoils. Professor To has published close to 300 journal and conference papers, supervised over 75 dissertations and theses, and has been honored with many awards, which include the 2015 ASME George Westinghouse Gold Medal for her work in gas turbine research, the 2016 Edwin Church Medal in Engineering Education, the ABET Claire Felbinger Diversity Award in 2017, and Air Breathing Propulsion Award by the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics uh, in 2019. So let's welcome Professor Karen Toll. Good evening, everyone. I um, and many thanks for that introduction. I think you can hear me okay. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can hear you, Professor. Okay, great. And I am going to share my screen here. See if that works okay. So, well, welcome to my talk. I'm very honored to be here and, um, you know, excited to give this talk to you today. I really wish I could be there in person. I've never been to India. I have many Indian friends, um, but maybe one day we'll all get to travel again. So, as you know, as was said, the, the title of my talk is Exploring Additive Manufacturing for Cooling Channel Designs. This is a very exciting area, and I'll I'll kind of go through why it's so exciting. I'm going to take you on a little journey here. Uh, what we're looking at is we're looking at a CT scan of a channel uh, and we're going down the center of the channel. And I'll show a few of these during my talk. I hope the video comes out okay. What you're seeing here is you're, you're changing angles as you go down this micro channel. And what you should be noticing, first of all, is that the surfaces are very rough. And this is inherent of additive manufacturing. But I hope, as you also notice, as you continue to go down the channel, the channels get a little bit smoother and the characteristic of the roughness changes quite a bit. So we're gonna talk about that today uh, in my presentation. I really wanna highlight here that all the people doing the work here that I get to talk about are shown in that picture. Those are my graduate students and also some of my research staff. So um, I get to give the talk, but they do all the work. So I want to acknowledge them up front. So with that, my presentation, I'm going to do, I'm going to try to co cover three different areas. Uh, first of all, I'm going to give you a little motivation for my research. As was said, I'm very interested in gas turbine heat transfer and cooling airfoils. And so that's the real motivation for this work. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the AM build effects, just like I showed previously on the on the video, is that there are a lot of um, inherent roughness levels, and those can be influenced by many different things when you build a part. It's not just as simple as press a channel and 3D build a part, a metal part. And then I'm going to give you a couple of exciting examples um, of geometries of microchannels um, and what happens. So, so my real motivation, of course, is cooling gas turbine airfoils. And, and really what this is, if you're not familiar with a turbine, is this is the high turbine suction in particular. That's the area I work in because that's the area that's the hottest and needs a lot of cooling. Um, and typically that cooling takes place by, film, by different cooling technologies, 
Generally, you do a film cooling on the outside of the airfoil to, pr to um, provide a cool layer. Sometimes you look at airfoil shaping. On the inside of the blade, if you look at the bottom picture, there's lots of different cooling geometries, um, ribs and pin fins that we're gonna talk about today are common ways to cool the inside of, of turbine blades. So, but, but these are limited. These are somewhat limited by different manufacturing methods. Um, and, and so, you know, while there's lots of cooling technologies, um, what we're gonna to explore today are some different ways to cool airfoils and how we might achieve those. So I wanted to just give you a little, because I'm a gas turbine enthusiast, I wanted to give you a few little fun facts to get you excited about gas turbines, especially for a heat transfer group. So, so one, one interesting thing is that one turbine blade is a, is a tremendous heat exchanger, all right? But if you, if you took the heat that is, that is transferred for one blade, you converted that to electricity, it could actually supply 18 homes with electricity. That's an awful lot of heat transfer. So these are the, that, that's what motivates our work. Another motivation is, is a turbine blade experiences incredible amounts of thermal stress. As a matter of fact, the amount of thermal stress that one blade experiences is like hanging an entire aircraft from that blade. So as that blade spins and is in a hot environment, it, it truly does experience a lot of thermal stress. So these are the two things that we're playing with all the time is, you know, how to remove the heat and how to make sure that the turbine blade we, doesn't have tremendous amounts of thermal stress due to temperature gradients. So I have a nice lab here at, at Penn State. And if any of you ever get a chance to, to come to Pennsylvania, we're in the middle of the state, come and visit our lab. But what we have is, in the lab is we actually have a test turbine. Uh, this was a lab that was built through the collaboration of our Department of Energy and Pratt and & Whitney. Uh, and what you see there is a, you know, two compressors producing about 25 pounds per second of air. Uh, that is, is then heated up in a heater, heater chamber, a natural gas burner. Uh, some of that air is siphoned off to cool the turbine parts. And then you see the turbine downstream, which is a one stage turbine. It's a vein and blade. So the vein and blade are really where, I'm at, where I want to talk a little bit about. So as, as, you, as I operate this facility, of course, I want to look at different cooling technologies and look at different um, airfoils, right? So uh, the real motivation for this work is that if I want to build a, or want to design a new turbine cooling uh, scheme for my turbine blade, and I want to make that turbine blade and test it, uh, it takes a quite, it takes a lot of time. This chart here illustrates all the different processes that a turbine blade needs to go through to be made. Again, it, you know, we're trying to make sure that that turbine blade can experience high temperatures with high thermal stresses. And, and to do that, today's turbine blades are made using single crystal technology and all those steps that you see illustrated on the left-hand side. So all those steps have to take place. And generally, that casting process I've listed here can take 70 weeks. In fact, we've been waiting two years for a set of turbine blades. So imagine getting excited about a new cooling technology and then having to wait two years to be able to test it. And it costs them about a million bucks for a ring of turbine blades. If I, want, if I do that same thing, but rather than go through these steps of single crystal and I made it using additive manufacturing, I can make it in about 16 weeks for less than $300,000, a whole ring of turbine blades. Now, I must say that additive manufacturing, metal additive manufacturing is not, cannot produce a blade that can operate in today's turbines given the heat and the thermal stress that it experiences. However, a turbine blade can be made using additive, there's still lots of challenges, and can be used for development purposes, such as testing, quicker testing, and so you can see what the, what the amount of time, how, how fast it speeds things up that allows us to test new designs and then finding a successful design, we can then actually put that into a real turbine. 
So that's the real power of additive manufacturing in the gas turbine area. So when you make a part, uh, this is a fishbone diagram and it illustrates all the different decisions that you need to make as you build a part, all the processing parameters and so forth. Two of the things that we're gonna talk about today, well, one of the things I'm gonna focus on up front today is build direction. So a turbine blade is three dimensional. Um, and so, but to build a part, and primarily here I'm looking at 3D printing, I'm looking at um, direct metal laser sintering. So there's essentially a powder bed where the laser light shines on the powder, melts the powder together, sinters the powder, and then another layer of metal comes across. That's the primary process I'm looking at. And, and to make that part, again, all these different decisions have to be made. And one of the big decisions up front is what orientation do you build the part? So you can see up here on the top right, um, you know, there's lots of ways to build a part. So we've been looking at this quite a bit and looking at the different directions of, that you can build a part. And we've been studying microchannels. Microchannels are also one way of cooling various turbine components is to have small channels in the skin of the airfoil. And so that's what we're looking at here, but these microchannels, and we're looking at the build direction effect, as well as a few other build uh, processing parameters that I'll talk about more as we go on. One of those is where to even place the part on the build plate and how that might influence the roughness and influence the part. So as I said, we did a really simple study. We, we've, been, we've done this a, a while back where we looked at building microchannels at different orientations from zero degrees, meaning a horizontal channel. So you're building the part up where the channel is horizontal or 90 degrees where the channel is vertical, all right? And we looked at a simple circular channel and we used Inconel 718 with 40 micron layer sizes of the powder on an EOS 280 machine. And we said, well, what is the roughness variation? How does it look? So the roughness varies quite a bit. And these are two videos at the top. On the left, you see the channel being built at the zero degrees. And as you might expect for zero degrees, uh, you see a lot of caving in of the top as the melt pool happens. Whereas on the right is a 90 degree channel that we built up in a vertical way. And you can see the different rings which represent the different layers. At the bottom, you actually see what those, what some slices look like as you go down the channel from the 90 degree build to the zero degree build for this one millimeter channel. In the middle top graph, you actually see what the roughness levels are and, and what's interesting about this graph is, is it shows as the build direction increases from zero to 90 degrees at about 45, well, at about 60 degrees, the actual roughness levels off. Uh, and the channel becomes much more round as opposed to much more, as opposed to oval. And so you can see a pretty dramatic change in roughness um, depending on build angle. Well, how does that influence the friction factor in the heat transfer of that microchannel? So first we'll look at friction factor. So these are a bunch of different channels. Um, and, and I know this graph is, is very busy on the left. I pulled out here a section um, that's around a Reynolds number of about 30,000. And on the right, you see a friction factor augmentation. So by friction factor augmentation, I mean the amount of uh, uh, pressure drop that happens relative to if you had a very smooth channel. So then, you know, the a, a Colebrook equation type um, smooth channel. And you can see that depending on the build direction, because of the roughness, the variation in the pressure drop is pretty dramatic. So um, at the zero degrees where you have the roughest channel, you might see a friction factor that is six times higher, six to eight times higher than would be for the case when you would have uh, a 90 degree build channel. So the variation is, is, is or, uh, sorry, the friction factor is, is about six to eight times higher for relative to a smooth channel. Whereas at 90 degrees, it's about two to, or it's about four to five times higher. But you do see this variation depending on the build direction. 
What happens to the heat transfer? Again, if we look at the heat transfer, this is interesting. The trend is a little different and I picked 20,000 here. Uh, and this is a new salt number augmentation. So again, a new salt number of the microchannel divided by the new salt number of just a smooth, uh, you know, like a Nilinsky or a Dennis Bolter type um, standard channel. So that's what the augmentation is. And what you can see is it sort of peaks at 45 degrees. This is interesting, right? Because it shows that at zero degrees, you don't get the highest augmentation. Um, but at 45 degrees, you get, the you get the highest augmentation. So there's some balance here uh, on the roughness. The surface morphology of the roughness really makes a difference um, in the sense that in some cases, you might have the powder that's very centered onto the surface and, and, and is a good heat conductor. Whereas in other cases, you may not have the powder as well centered onto the surface and it's just causing drag and increasing pressure drop. So you can definitely see that there might be a, an optimum angle to build if you're trying to increase heat transfer for a particular um, pressure drop. So then we did, went on and did another simple study and looked at um, channel shapes. This is interesting. We looked at everything from a circle to a, to a pentagon, to a hexagon, to a diamond. And really the goal here was to try to understand um, you know, different, different shapes. If you look, go to the basic heat transfer textbook, um, there aren't that many shapes that are truly given, for, given as correlations. We wanted to know, is hydraulic diameter the true, the true dimension that represents all these different shapes channels? So that was our intention is, is to look at hydraulic diameter as a scaling parameter. And in fact, we found that hydraulic diameter did okay in scaling the data, um, but actually the, the cross-sectional area of the particular channel did a little bit better. So on the left, we show the friction factor and on the right, we show the Neusselt number again. And these for, are for all the different channel shapes that we tested. The first thing to note here is that all of the open symbols on the graph on the left are for smooth channels. And this was work that was previously done, uh, as well as some benchmark data. So all of the data here pretty much collapse well um, on the friction factor using the cross-sectional area. And this was previously shown in the literature. <clears throat> but if you look at all of the closed symbols, those are all made using additive manufacturing. And of course, those are lifted off the friction factor curve. They're much higher because of the roughness of the channel. And again, they don't perfectly scale and you, you start to see some differences between the blues and the oranges. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that, why that is, but you do see that, it, I'm not showing this here, but if I used hydraulic diameter as the, as the scaling parameter, it doesn't scale as well as the cross-sectional area. On the right is the Neusselt number. And again, you see the Neusselt number being augmented beyond what you would get for a smooth channel. And you see the collapse of data fairly good um, for using the cross-sectional area. So you certainly see some different, um, you, you, so you see these cooling shapes are, are well, are, are pretty much able to be correlated using, using the cross-sectional area. If we look at it a different way, we can look at the Neusselt number augmentation um, as a function of the friction factor augmentation. So this tells you how much heat transfer are you really getting for the particular pressure drop, which is always the, the trade-off in many applications. And you can see that the square does a pretty good job, um, but they are we are definitely getting a, a lot of heat transfer due to these rough surfaces. On the right, I've looked at this a little bit different. I've actually looked at it relative to a circle. We always think about a microchannel as being a circular microchannel, but in fact, we could use any of these shapes, right? So relative to the circle, how do these, how do these other shapes perform? Turns out that the circle does a pretty good job. So much of the heat transfer augmentation that you see on the graph in the right falls below the circle. There are certainly the trapezoid and the square um, fall above the circle in terms of uh, doing better in terms of heat transfer, but they're also giving a higher pressure drop. 
So this actually, this data actually shows that maybe a circular cylinder isn't bad, even though you would expect that some of the other shapes may have some secondary flow structures that would give you um, better heat transfer. So one of the things that we found that actually became a mystery to us now flipping back to the additive manufacturing piece is we found that there, was, there were different levels of roughness on each surface. Of, of the channel that we made. And so on the right here, um, these, this, is this very colorful graph shows for every colored um, surface what the roughness levels are. So if, you, if you, you pick on the square, for example, you see that the red surface and the green surface have much higher roughness levels than the blue and the yellow. We call that the 12 o'clock surface and the six o'clock surface. Why, why would the 12 o'clock and the six o'clock have higher roughness levels than the other two? This really was a mystery to us, given the fact that all of these channels were built in a vertical um, configuration. So they weren't built horizontally. If they were built horizontally, one might expect that the 12 o'clock surface would have a lot of roughness. But in fact, all of these surface were, surfaces were built, or all of these channels were built in a vertical way. Now, and it's even more confusing when you look at the diamond. A diamond is just like a square, only it's turned, <laughs> um, it's rotated. And in fact, the diamond all had pretty low roughness levels relative to the 12 o'clock and six o'clock surfaces. So again, this really became a mystery to us. And we tried, we looked at a, a many different things in, in what was happening. As a matter of fact, this slide illustrates all the many different things. Again, the point I want to make here is that there aren't simple decisions to just be made when or there's many decisions to be made when you're building a part using um, additive manufacturing. So we looked at the recoder blade direction. So in other words, how, how the layer, the new layer of um, powder was being introduced. We looked at the build location on the plate. We looked at the contouring priority, which is a, the last laser pass. And then the other thing we looked at is the wall thickness. So you can see this little coupon on the left. What we did is we put the, we put the micro channel in this coupon and we varied the distance from the, my, the channel itself to the outer wall. Well, it turns out that that had the biggest impact. In fact, as we were building this channel, what was happening is the outside of the surface the melt pool was actually influence, influencing the amount of roughness on that channel wall. So this graph on the bottom shows the red, the red is the, the red bars are this outer wall or this outer channel roughness level. And you can see that that channel roughness increases with decreasing wall thickness. So you can see the highest wall or highest roughness here and the lowest roughness um, on channel one. And that's because channel one had a pretty thick wall on top of it. The green surface is roughly about all the same uh, in terms of roughness. And that was the bottom wall where we maintained a constant thickness um, below the wall. So this, again, this says, okay, your wall roughness, which turbine blades have very thin walls, it can affect the overall roughness of, of your, the channel that you might be making, which is an important effect. Okay, let me give you now a couple of fun things. So, you know, we, we use all this, we, we gained all this knowledge on how to build things. And then we wanted to have a little bit of fun and say, what? let's build some fun shapes that are hard to make using cast. So, you know, one of the first things we looked at is different shaped pin fins. Uh, and pin fins are often used in the trailing edge of a turbine blade, as I show on the left. Um, and so we built um, a number of pins where we looked at a circular pin fin, which is the standard. We looked at a diamond pin. We looked at a triangular pin where the point was facing into the flow and then one facing um, you know, downstream. The point was facing downstream from the flow. And so we built a number of these coupons the picture on the right is a CT scan of what those coupons look like. And again, you can see the, there's very rough surfaces uh, as these coupons are built. There's a roughness on the, actual, um, on the actual pin itself. And then there's a roughness on the surface of the end wall. 
Turns out that the end wall roughness levels are much higher than what's on the pin uh, in many cases. So I'm showing here, you know, some overall results. Um, there's three sets of bars with three different spacing locations between the pins, which turns out that the spacing in the range we looked at wasn't a big factor. So, um, but what was a big factor, of course, was the pin shape. And as you might expect, uh, if you look at on the left is the, the friction factor augmentation. And you can see that, you know, you get about 27 times higher than the friction factor you would get for a smooth channel with no pin fins. Um, and, and, you know, and the highest uh, pressure drops were happening with triangles pointing downstream. So you had that flat face of the triangles pointing upstream. Uh, and then in the Nusselt number range, you know, you're not seeing a, a clear winner. Maybe the diamond um, would give you a little bit higher augmentation relative to the other two um, flow, flow conditions. I think what was important out of this study was, and some of these shapes have been studied before, what was important that we realized here is that there were many correlations out in the literature that predict Nusselt number um, for different pin spacings, but what was missing was a term when we went to additive manufacturing. So we uh, did a lot of studies to add another term in there, which is a roughness term. And once we were able to add that roughness terms, we were able to get a lot of data um, from different studies, including our own study, to agree within that correlation to plus minus 20% or even better. Um, and so you can see that graph on the left is the Nusselt number predicted versus the Nusselt number measured um, with our given correlation. So again, we're, we're pretty close to predicting our correlation well. Uh, and then on the right, you can actually see the prediction uh, and, and also some other correlations that have been pre previously presented in the literature um, for different pin shapes. And, and our correlation overlays their correlation when the roughness level is, is zero or smooth. And of course, their correlation was built with a roughness level of zero. Another really fun study we did, and I'll, um, this is my other example that I want to go through, is we've looked at wavy channels. Um, and this was a, a nice application by my student who looked at a wavy microchannel. So again, on the upper right is a coupon that we have and inside that coupon are wavy channels rather than straight channels. We had rectangular channels that were uh, in a wave orientation. We looked at both amplitude of the wave and wave and as well as um, the wavelength. So you can see this little graphic on the left is that we increased and decreased the wavelength relative to a nominal, and then we increased and um, we increased and decreased the amplitude and increased and decreased the wavelength to see what the overall impact of that would be on heat transfer and friction factor. So some results are shown here. And, and, and really what this showed is that there was a pretty um, dramatic effect on when you change the wavelength in particular, at least over the range that we looked at. You can see the, the half wavelength relative to the nominal gave pretty high um, friction factor um, augmentations. And on the right, you can also see it gave pretty high heat transfer augmentations. Um, some of the other ones, uh, you know, so, so the wavelength seemed to have a bigger impact rather than the amplitude as, a, as we have studied what our ranges are. So this is interesting, but we, we wanted to go further in this study and say, okay, what could we do um, to see whether or not we could scale this data? And we looked at a term called relative waviness, which has been presented in the literature before, and you can see this graph is a lot of data, but it turns out that for, and, and those lines represent different Reynolds numbers. And so for each Reynolds number, um, we, we actually plotted the augmentation of friction factor, the augmentation of Nusselt number on the left two graphs as a function of the ratio of the amplitude divided by the wavelength, which is a relative waviness. And we could see that the data would line up on particular trend curves. 
So this actually is, is really a powerful tool in terms of, you know, if we were designing, if we wanted to learn to design a, a wavy channel. On the right is, a, it's a, is an efficiency number where we're looking at um, the Nusselt number relative to the friction factor to the one third power. And that's basically the pumping power is why, why we have it raised to the one third power. And so this is the amount of heat transfer you get for a given um, pumping power or friction factor uh, augmentation. And you can see that there's, a, there's, a, there's an optimum that happens um, for a particular relative waviness. So this was a this was a new finding, I think, in the literature that that um, we're presenting in a, or I'm presenting here today, as well as uh, at a, at a future conference. So this was a pretty exciting result for us because it it can be used as a design curve. So with that, I'm going to end my talk, and I and I hope there's some things that you took away from my talk. One is is that I hope you took away the fact that you know there's lots of different decisions to be made when you make a part. I didn't talk about processing parameters. We have lots of other studies on those, and those all those parameters affect the amount of friction factor and heat transfer augmentation or pressure drop and heat transfer that you could expect in your microchannel. The other thing I hope you took away from my talk is is the excitement the excitement of being able to use additive manufacturing, 3D printing to build parts faster, cheaper, and also more complex than we've been able to build parts before. And, and so we've looked at different channel shapes, we looked at different wave designs uh, and so forth. And so it really opens up the creativity of students to be able to use additive manufacturing and come up with um, some, some different designs. So with that, I will um, stop and, and thank you very much for your attention. Again, I wanna give all the credit to my students and my research staff, uh, and I'm happy to take any questions. Yep. Um, thank you very much, Professor, for uh, an interesting talk on the various aspects of uh, additive manufacturing for cooling channel designs and uh, the resulting heat transfer and pressure drop um, characteristics. Uh, I have a few doubts. Um, the first uh, uh, one is um, you have presented some results, uh, uh, this uh, surface roughness, the influence of build direction on the roughness that you have been. So what was the material used for fabrication in this? Yeah, so that's a great question. That It was Inconel 718. So that's a common high temperature material. But okay. I will say that, um, you know, we've also looked at other kinds of metal powdered metal. Mm. And I would say you're, you still get similar levels of roughness. Um, and, and so the additive process, so I'd say these results are not so specific to the type of material, um, okay. but they're more specific to the processes and processing parameters that you use when you 3D print a part. Okay, just thank you. Um, just one more question. Um, uh, you have shown the effect of uh, shapes, different shapes, right? Different shapes. Yep. So what was kept uh, constant in these studies? What was, what is the parameter? Yeah. Also great, great question. And I should have mentioned that when I was giving the talk. What we did on that particular talk is we kept the surface area of the channel the same. Because okay, we surface wanted area. to, right. We wanted to keep the surface area of the channel the same because okay. we're testing heat transfer, right? And so we okay. kept that same, the same, and then, you know, we scaled okay. each channel size to okay. make sure we okay. always so, met that surface area. So basically the perimeter you're talking about, basically the perimeter, the right? Perimeter, the perimeter, right, the weather perimeter, yep. Yeah, oh, okay, thank you. Yeah, and coming to this uh, wavy channels, wavy channels, wavy channels, right? Uh, right. Uh, wow, so what was the roughness uh, for these wavy channels, roughness as a result of this uh, additive manufacturing? Yeah, so I, I don't have that listed, but I, yeah. um, and I, it's in my our paper, but I don't know if I, but it, it is roughly, roughly, it is, it is about the same as some of the other roughness levels that we saw with our, with our micro channel. So it's in that okay. range, right? Okay. So, it, so yeah. it didn't get, we didn't get any more roughness or any less roughness with the wavy channel. So, so yeah, the roughness was same for different ap amplitudes and also the wavelengths, yeah. right? Yeah. Yep, okay. that's right. We yeah. did not see yeah. a big difference in that. 
The bigger difference is really what we did identify, which was a surprise to us, is the wall thickness of our coupon. We tried okay. to make thin walls because uh, because of the method we used to measure heat transfer. Um, and 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 uh, you know, as the wall got thinner, which is in many applications, you know, the roughness actually increased. That was a big okay. surprise. Like we didn't we didn't have that we didn't know about that, and and that's not okay. really in the literature anywhere. Okay, thank you. Um, what do you think? Uh, no, uh, is the factor um, no uh, uh, that limits the application of present day uh, this additive manufacturing technology for the present day high temperature uh, gas turbine uh, applications? You said in the very beginning that you uh, know uh, it cannot be used, right? So what is that factor? The the issue is. <laughs> that the the amount of stress and mm. the high temperatures that you have to achieve in a turbine are just not gonna we don't have high temperature materials that we can add it that we can 3d print right okay and okay, so, okay and 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 so okay. you know just imagine you're starting with powder and you're mm. building a part and that part is going is supposed to be able to withstand holding an entire plane aircraft okay. from it, right? Okay. That's a little okay. scary. But, okay. you know, having said that, um, you know, where, where, my, where we operate our test turbine, we don't operate at full temperature, right? And our blades don't experience as much thermal stress. So we operate in kind of a sweet spot in the sense that mm. we can really use additive to go quicker to make blades and mm -hmm. and and actually study different designs and if we get a successful design then we can think about how we're going to make that out of, um out, out of cast you know single crystal cast blades and so that that's really powerful the question that we're going to answer this year in our research which i'm really excited about is we're actually doing a back-to-back -back comparison between cast blades and additive blades to see whether or not we truly get the same results and we can achieve no. the same results. So okay. once we answer that question, it really then validates our, our approach in using additive manufacturing. Okay, yeah, yeah. Thank, you. thank you, thank you, Professor. Thank you, Professor, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, any questions from uh, the participants? Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. I yeah. see a couple yeah. of questions. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, there the, are some, yeah. I uh, see, is the effect of wavelength and amplitude. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, is the effect of wavelength and amplitude of the wavy channel specific to the current application? Because there have been conflicting studies in terms of the effects of these parameters with no clear reason as to why. Um, so, I, first of all, I, the, the most of the wavy channel work in the literature is for laminar flows. Okay. So if you want to classify that as a the current application, we're looking at turbulent Reynolds numbers, right? We're looking at Reynolds numbers of 20,000, 30,000. So um, I'd say that, you know, our results are not necessarily specific in, it, it's specific to that turbulent range. Um, as a matter of fact, we're in a range of, of turbulent, the, the waves that we channel, the wavy channels that we studied immediately went to almost a constant friction factor um, because the friction factor um, because the channel is rough, was rough and also because of the wave the turbulence level was um, you know the turbulence happened quickly right so we never even saw the laminar you know friction factor 64 over Reynolds number um, regime and so so we are looking at that so I, I wouldn't and and the reason why these waves are working is because and and I didn't have time to go through all that in this in this presentation is you definitely see the flow characteristic as the the you know the flow goes around these channels right so as the flow accelerates around a curve you actually get high heat transfer right and as you you know start to build these waves and let's say you have higher and higher amplitudes of waves the flow sees it as a flow blockage, right? And it has to go up and around. So you increase the pressure drop. So the, there's certainly reasons why we're getting increased heat transfer and friction factor depending on the wavelength. You can you can look at the, the 3D flow. We did a 3D CFD flow simulation and you can certainly see why 
why it's happening. So it's mainly the flow structure. Yeah. yeah. Uh, just one more question, Professor. Uh, what is the effect of roughness on the air side and the, uh, outside? That's from Professor Venkatratnam. Yeah, so that's a great question. Again, you know, maybe I should have given that a little bit more background in the beginning of my talk. So really, we're a lot, we're, what I've been talking about is inside the channel. And the reason is, is because we're looking at small channels and it's nearly impossible to, to, to have um, post-processing post -processing, um, ways to clean out that channel and remove the roughness. On the outside of an airfoil, you can um, tumble apart or you can blast apart and you can actually get rid of the roughness. So you can get a very smooth outside part. So in our turbine blades, you know, we've got in intricate internal channels that have a lot of roughness that we can't get rid of. It's just inherent to the process. But on the outside, we can machine it or post-process it uh, and that gives us a very smooth surface. So there is definitely differences between the outside and the inside in what you can do for our application. Okay. Oh, thank you, Professor. Uh, there's one more question from Professor Arul Prakash. Um, it's on the durability of additive manufacturing components. Yeah, so, you know, again, I don't know what exactly the limit is gonna be in terms of temperature and, and how that's gonna affect the life of the part. Um, but I can say that, you know, for our rig, I think that we did all the due diligence to make sure our turbine blade doesn't blow apart as we put it in our rig. Um, and so we're hoping that, you know, it does have a long life. Um, and so the durability is going to be hopefully what we need to need to use at least to, uh, to assess and test our turbine parts. Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you, Professor. There is one more question from Mr. Reji Joseph. Uh, very nice presentation. Uh, what are the constraints, how the channels are um, accepted? Yeah, so, so I don't, so the constraints are maybe sometime, it, they're really subjective. <laughs> so, so let me give you an example. Um, you know, the channels that I showed are channels that we built and you know we used all the best processing parameters that we knew of and, and what were recommended for our the EOS 280 machine. We didn't play around with the processing parameters, at least the data I showed today didn't play around with the processing parameters. Um, however, you know, now we're at a point where we're additively manufacturing blades. Um, and now the constraints become very important because there are parts of the blades that in fact print very well, uh, depending on the orientation, and there are parts of the blades that don't print well. So the constraint in, the, in a turbine application becomes whether or not you can truly meet, your, meet the amount of flow for a given pressure uh, that you have for your turbine blades. So if, if you're, you know, even, even like regular manufacturing and casting of blades don't come out perfect. And, and so, you know, there's a certain range that a company might say that within that range, if we can meet the amount of flow for a given pressure drop in that part, you know, it passes. Um, but if it, if it doesn't and you can't get the amount of cooling flow in that turbine blade, it, it may not pass, right? And then you have to scrap the part. And, and, that's, and, and what's interesting, even with cast blades and why it takes so long is that you might, make, you might make 20 turbine blades and you might only get one that works. So the, the, the yield rate is incredibly low because it's such a hard process. So the constraint, that's really becomes the constraint is can you meet the cooling flow so you can truly cool that turbine blade. Yeah. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you, Professor. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Um, any further questions, please? Yeah, I hope there are no further questions. So if there are no further questions, um, let us thank Professor Karen Toll once again for her taking the time to deliver a wonderful talk. Um, and thank you all for uh, joining the talk. Many, many thanks, and I wish you a very successful conference. I will listen, be listening in sometimes during the weekend. Okay, thank you, Professor. Thank you, Professor Tom.
Okay, bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. The organizing team thanks Professor Karen Thol for her insightful talk and Professor Sadesh for chairing the session. We thank all the authors and audience for their participation. The session one officially ends now. Thank you all.